Are we ready? Okay, let's do it. Before we get into the word of God today, let's pause and have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Loving Father in heaven, we thank you so very much. We want to turn the attention toward you this morning. That the words that are spoken, Father, the, these beautiful music we've heard today and all that we say and do this morning will bring honor and glory to your name. Father, we're asking right now that you will speak to our hearts. As it is said in the book of 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, that the Spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue. Would you do that for me this morning, Father, and also bless the heart of your people? It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, the title of this message is The Fourth angel's message. You may be asking, is there such a thing as a fourth angel? The answer is yes. Now, let's look at a few t statistics and numbers very quickly, because as a church, we know God has called us to proclaim the gospel of Jesus, particularly the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14, 6 to 12. But let's look at some things. In the world church today, Christianity makes up about 31%. And if you look at this graph, I'm not sure how much you can see. The Seventh-day Adventist church is only about 2% of this stat. Which implies that we are very, very, very small. I went over to the Adventist church website to look at the actual church membership, we are about 21 million, close to 22 million members. Okay. Somebody might say, that's great. Not really. When you compare these numbers to the world, just for the sake of today's presentation and study or Bible or sermon, we're going to say there are about 22 million Seventh-day Adventists in the world, internationally. When you compare this to the rest of the churches, we are still very small. And to top it off, we must keep in mind the world's population, according to the United Nations, is about 8 billion people. Now, if you were to put some numbers together, talking about the church going about to evangelize the world of different sects. We have the atheists, the agnostics, the unbelievers, the non-denominational. We have the Catholics, then the Protestants, the evangelicals, whatever, right? So we put all of them in this 8 billions and 22 million Seventh-day Adventists on fire for Jesus are going to minister and bring them to the message of the three angels. Now, let's take a look at what that looks like on paper. So when you do some divisions here, what we're looking at, if 22 million Seventh-day Adventists were on fire, and I'm pushing it because we know 10% really get 90% of the work done, but let's just say 22 million were actually doing the work, right? They were on fire, and they were preaching, and they were ministering, and they were looking for ways to save and bring individuals to the gospel of Jesus. Now, with that being said, we're looking at over 360 million, 636,364. So what this means is every Adventist in their lifetime will have to win this many souls before Jesus comes. Anybody ready? And when you push that a little bit further, let's just say we have a year to get this thing done, 365 days. So which means for 365 days, every day within that year period, we need to win at least 996,264, I think I lost count. So what I'm trying to show you here is that looking at the, the extensiveness of the work 
that needs to be done and the numbers I feel exactly this way. <laughs> and we can now say mission impossible. Mission impossible. No, no matter how zealous we may be, no matter how strong and effective we may be in our love for God to minister to souls, comparing these numbers to our human effort, it could never get done. But here is the thing we need to keep in mind. In Mark chapter 10, 27, the Bible tells us that with men, it is impossible. But not with God. For with God, all things are possible. In Jeremiah 32, verse 17, we are told, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? So despite the numbers, we are still called to do a work that is beyond our human effort. When we go to Revelation uh, chapter 18, as Sean had read for us earlier this morning, what we find is the greatest miracle or the greatest evangelistic outreach and most effective one ever to be carried out by the remnant church. In Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 to 4, the Bible tells us, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having what kind of power? Great power. And what else? And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful birds. So now we have now is this proclamation of the fourth angel's message, which really is not a new message. It is a repetition of the old message. Let's look at that. In Revelation chapter 18, what you are hearing simply is this. We are seeing a repetition of the second and third angel's message of Revelation chapter 14, but with greater power. Now, you have to keep in mind, when the Adventist church came, emerged from the Miller Rights Movement, and established in 1866, the proclamation of the first angel's message was already preached. You say, how so? You are an Adventist. The reason we exist is because we've accepted and believed and preached the first angel's message. Now, majority of the Christian church today might have rejected these messages. However, the Adventist church believe that we are living in the time of the judgment, believe that God is our creator, therefore we also honor his seven-day Sabbath. We also believe we ought to feel God and give him glory. However, the message of the second angel and the third angel has not been preached with greater power yet. And the second thing we are learning from this particular passage is that it represents the people of God empowered by the latter rain going forth to give the loud cry. So God is going to get this stuff done. And God is going to get it done through someone. I wonder, is it going to be me? Is it going to be you? In the book, The Great Controversy, I'm going to be quoting extensively from this book. Uh, it is said in page 464, paragraph 1, before the final visitation of God's judgment upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and power of God will be poured out upon his children at that time. Many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted love for God and his word. Many, both ministers and people, will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. So what I'm trying to say, friends, is simply this. Our best days are ahead of us. 
If you think you have seen great evangelistic work, wait till you see the proclamation of the loud cry or the third and second angel's message. God has great things in store for his church. When we go to the book of Joel chapter 2 verse 28, we read this prophecy. And I want you to look at the words and how different they are in comparison to the book of Acts chapter 2. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Now when we jump over to the book of Acts chapter 2, we are seeing a partial fulfillment of this prophecy among the early church. In Acts 2 verse 17, listen to the difference in the word here. Peter is quoting Joel chapter 2 verse 28 and look how different the words are. And it shall come to pass, says Peter, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. So the difference is that Joel says, I will pour out my spirit. But when Peter proclaims the message, he says, God says he will pour out of my spirit. What's the difference? Peter understood this prophecy was only partially being fulfilled in the early church. And the implication is that Joel chapter 2 prophecy has yet to be fulfilled completely. So now when we move what we are looking at from our screen, the early church had what is known as the early reign, but the remnant church will experience the latter reign. So how effective was the work of the Holy Spirit during the early church movement? To better understand this, we have to travel back in time. And one of the best ways we can discover the, the characteristics or the works of the early church is to look at Revelation chapter 6, where it speaks about the seven seals of Revelation. But what we find in Revelation chapter 6, reading from verse 1, the Bible speaks about a white horse. A white horse and he went on to say, and I saw when a lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, come and see. Now, what we see under the symbolism of this white horse, I saw a white horse, and he that sat on it had a bow and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering to conquer. This white horse, when you carefully study this, this represents the work that God did among the early apostles, the early church, or the apostolic church. This white horse, are num there are a number of symbolism that we need to look at here very quickly. The first thing we see is the horse is white, which represents purity. It had a bow, which also represents the word of God. And he had a crown of victory. Lastly, it is said that this church went about conquering to conquer. To understand what God is going to do again, we need to study what God has done before among the early church. So this white horse time period was actually in AD 31 to AD 100, which represents a pure faith. So what are some characteristics we can learn from the Bible about this white horse or the early church? Let's see what they did then so that we can look to the future of what God is going to do again. Number one, the early church, they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. This was the most essential component of their success. Without the Holy Spirit, there was nothing they could do for God to minister to the world. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the Bible tells us, And you shall receive power, Christ speaking to them before he ascended to heaven, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So Jesus tells them, once you receive power, 
you are going to start witnessing all around the world. In Acts chapter 2, these words were fulfilled, and they claim and preach the gospel to all those who were around. Today, friends, there is a need for us to pray for the Holy Spirit, like we've never done before. We are told in Testimony for the Church, volume 5, 158, we should pray as earnestly for the descent of the Holy Spirit, as the disciples prayed on the day of Pentecost. And if they needed it at that time, we need it more today. Today, our church is in need of power. Not more plans. Not more good thinking in discussions or board meetings. We are in need of the Holy Spirit. The second thing we learn about the early church is that they were separate from the world. In John chapter 17, Jesus says this of them, And I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from evil, from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. A.W. Tower said it this way. Modern Christians hope to save the world by being like it. But it will never work. The church power over the world springs out of her unlikeness to it. Never from her integ integration, integration into it. And the words that he's saying here, friends, opposites attract. <laughs> The more the church behave like the world is the more the world become less attractive to the message of the church. It's true. But the more they see something different about who we are is the more they wonder about the God we serve. J.C. Riles said it this way, Dr. J.C. Riles, there is a common worldly kind of Christianity in this, in this day which many have and think they have enough a cheap Christianity which offends no one, requires no sacrifice, which costs nothing and is worth nothing. If you were to go to the world and you compare the attitude and the behaviors of Christian to that of the world, there is no difference. But that's not how God intended his church to be. We are not saying we got to be like hermits here. We're not saying you got to be so far from the world that you can't understand anything that's going on in it. No, we are to be spiritually minded and yet earthly good. But while this is happening, let's not so become imbibed and imbued with worldliness that we lose the power of the gospel. James chapter 4 verse 4 says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the Bible went on to say, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, save the Lord, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You see, the word church came from the Greek word ecclesias, where you get it in Spanish, ecclesias in French is l'église. And the idea is the called out. In other words, the Christians have been called out separate and set apart from the things of this world. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people. That you should go forth, you should show forth to show the praises of him who have called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Not only we have been called out, but we are called to be the light of the world. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 14 and 16, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You see, the early apostles, the early church, they understood in order for us to affect the world, we cannot be like the world. 
So in uh, Christ, uh, the great controversy, page 46, paragraph 2, we are told that the early church were indeed a peculiar people. Their blameless department and unswerving faith were a continual reproof that disturbs the sinner's peace. Though few in numbers, without wealth, position, or honorary titles, they were a terror to evildoers wherever their character and doctrines were known. Sometimes I wonder, is, is, is modern Christianity even one inch near what we're reading here today? A terror to evildoers. Mr. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, the Bible is not the light of the world. It is the light of the church. But the world does not read the Bible. The world reads Christians. You are the light of the world. The third characteristic of the early church is that they love Jesus and his truths. These people had a love for Christ and his precious truth. We are told a story of a man named Simus Magus. Um, he came to the apostle Peter. He's trying to buy the Holy Spirit. <laughs> In Acts chapter 8, verses 18 and 20, when Simon saw that through laying on hands the, of the apostles, hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money saying, give me also this power that on whosoever I lay hands, I may receive the Holy Ghost. But Simon was practicing witchcraft. He was a wizard. But he wanted to use the power of God for worldly gain. Peter went on to rebuke him. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. If there is one thing that is destroying the lifeline of Christians today, it is the love of money. Friends, let's be honest. Money is a defense. Wisdom is a defense. But let's be careful with money. Let's be very careful with it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, but this but know this, difficult times will come in the last days. Verse 2 says, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money. I went and did a little bit of digging in online, and I saw a number of videos. I will not be calling anybody's name. And, and, and these, these ministers were, were on the pulpit preaching, and people were running, emptying out the pocketbook, on the pulpit, and he was running around on the stairs. He's saying, I'm, I am sanctifying this money. I'm blessing it in Jesus' name. The wealth of these modern-day ministers today is something that we cannot calculate. Some will go as far as to say, I deserve a, a three-something billion-dollar plane when majority of your members take the bus to attend your church. The lifestyle of pastors in our world today is not that of the, holy, the early church at all. Recently, a man in New York was robbed while preaching the gospel, which I thought was wrong. But when I read of how much money he had on him, I said, Lord have mercy, you call the robbers. He was preaching, and as he was preaching, the back door opened and these men walked inside the church with guns and went directly for him. By the time they robbed the men, it's been said they collected over $1 million in assets on him while preaching. Come on, bro. Listen. Nobody should be robbed, especially while they're preaching the gospel. Amen. But why are you preaching the gospel with a million dollars worth of jewelry on you in the first place? Just saying. Great Controversy 386, paragraph 1. A high salary is paid for a talented minister to entertain and attract the people. His sermons must not touch popular sins. 
but be made smooth, pleasing for fashionable hearers, fashionable ears. Thus, fashionable sinners are enrolled on the church record, and fashionable sins are concealed under the pretense of godliness. Today, that's what we get. We're getting a, a, a gospel that is more entertaining, uh, more uh, motivational than a gospel that leads us to the cross. No wonder why it, it, the, 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 the world doesn't even fear the church. I'm so glad this is not happening in this church, amen? John Bunyan said it best. Gold and the gospel seldomly agree. Religion always takes side with poverty. This doesn't mean because you're a Christian you can't make money, you can't live nice. No, 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 that's not what he's saying. What he is saying here is simply say, be, be careful though, because money and the gospel, they don't, they don't really like each other. Proverbs 23, verse 23, we need to buy the truth and sell it not. Buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Too many today are selling the truth for popularity, for acceptance, just to be accepted by the world. No. Charles Spurgeon said it best. Yeah, I love me some Spurgeon. You, should got, you guys should know this by now. We should not adjust our Bible to the age. But before we have done with it, by God's grace, we shall adjust the age to the Bible. <laughs> Lord have mercy. In other words, we ain't changing our message to suit a carnal, sinful world who are unrepentant in their condition. No, the world needs to get on board with that message. Let's move on. They had the spirit of altruism and benevolence. The early church were a people who loved people. They loved each other, even those without the church. In Acts 2, 44 to 45, the Bible tells us, all that believe were together and had all things in common, all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. So these people will go beyond to give their last dimes, their last clothes on their back to help their brothers and sisters in the faith. In Acts 4 verse 34 and 37, we are told neither was there any of them that lacked. For as many were possessors of land and houses, sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid down at the apostles' feet, and distributions was made unto every man according as he had need. This is what God is calling us to do today. As the early church did, so the people of God in the last day are to do. Anne Frank said it this way, Anna Frank, no one has ever become poor by giving. In Luke 6, 38, we are told, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure you meet, withal it shall be measured to you again. Friends, the more you give is the much more you will receive. And the more you open your heart to be a blessing to others, God will open the windows of heavens and pour out a blessing where there will be room enough to receive. Number five, they were perfectly united in love and in fellowship. In Acts 4 verse 32, we are told that the multitude of them that believe were of one heart and of one soul. In Acts 2 verse 46, we are told they continue daily on with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Tertullian, church historian, in the book Apology, page 32, 39, he said it this way about the early church love for one another. He said, It is mainly... 
It is mainly the deed of a love so noble that lead many to label us. See, they say, how they love one another for themselves or animated by mutual hatred. How they are so ready to die for one another. For they themselves will sooner put to death the family's possession with general destroy brotherhood among you, create fraternal bonds among us, one in mind and soul. We do not hesitate to share our earthly goods with one another. All things are common among us, but our wives. Yeah, Amen. You better get that one right. We, we, we're not sharing this one. <laughs> Unfortunately, today, there is so much division among Seventh-day Adventists, it is actually sad to see. We have the conservative, we have the pro progressive, we have the regular line, the regular line, the pro-conferences and the anti-conference, the reform, the offshoot, and so on. I have to tell you, that's not of God. That's not of God. God has one single church, and God has a way of doing things. Don't get me wrong, God can work through all this mess, but this is not God's fault. How do we have one foundation, which is the word, and we are so divided at heart? In John 17, 21, we are told that day all may be one, as, the, as thou art the Father are in me, I in them, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The worst testimony for the church is the division that is among us. The best testimony for the church is the union and the love we have for one another. As the world see that we are united not only in faith, in doctrine, but in spirit, they will believe. In John 17, 34, verse 35, we are told, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have, one, if you have loved one to another. Number six, the early church, they placed a high value on prayer and Bible study. We are told that these individuals were confronted with a situation where the, the, the women Greek were not being attended and cared for. You will think the apostles will be like, okay, okay, so let's go take care of this need because it's a dire need. But they understood, instead of us doing that, we are going to ordain some other ministers, some other deacon and deaconesses to carry out that work. They said in verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. In Manuscript Releases, volume 20, 268, paragraph 5, prayer and faith will do what no power on earth can accomplish. Friends, as a church, we, we can't stop praying. Because we, without us praying, nothing could be done. It is the engine of everything we do. It empowers everything we say and every effort we put together. Chuck Smith said, there are more bottles won through prayer than by any other means. More is done on your knees than you do running up and down and everywhere. More is done as you pray and you believe in God than anything else you could do personally. Last but not least, number seven, they were evangelistic in nature. The early church were purpose-driven. Now, the positive side of purpose-driven. <laughs> In Acts 2, verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So this was a normal thing for them. As they went about sharing the gospel, these individuals were dedicated to minister to the lost. We are told in verse 47 of Acts chapter 2, 
praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as you'll be saved. I thought about that. I said, Lord have mercy. Daily? So that means the church was open daily. That means they were working daily. Let's be honest. Can we say that the church adds to the church daily today? No, 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 I'm pushing it. Let's say the Lord adds to the church weekly. No, okay, no. let's move it to monthly. Okay, let's go yearly. Friends, some of our churches, they are winning no souls. It's no souls. And this goes to show something is wrong. Something is wrong. And a change needs to be made. In Acts 17, verse 6, we are told, When they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brothers unto the rulers of the city, crying, These have turned the world upside down and are come hither also. That's what they were doing. How did they do this, friends? The Holy Spirit. We are told that the white horse went about conquering to conquer. The early church started with 120 believers in the upper room. And just about uh, 40 years, we are told that they grew to 5 million members. Lord have mercy. So strong were their work that the scripture tells us there were Christians in Caesar's household. You take that. We are told that, that 3,000 souls were baptized in a day. This was normal for them. We were told demons were cast out. The very presence and the shadow of Paul will heal the sake. We were told that, that new converts were made every single day. Miracles were wrought. The Gentiles were grafted into the branch. We are told even the pagans burned their books as a result of the works of the early church. The gospel spread all throughout North Africa and so on as a result of the Holy Spirit. When we go to uh, Colossians chapter 123, if you continue in faith grounded and settled, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, listen to the next few words, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. In essence, what he is saying, by the time Paul came on the scene, and by the time he got of age, the Bible tells us that the gospel had gone out through the whole world. An unknown writer said it this way, you Christians are everywhere. You are in our armies, in our navies, you are in the marketplace, in the shops, you are in our senate, in our universities, you are everywhere. So, could God do it again? Not only he can, he will. Let me read to you. Last day events, 203 paragraph 1. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than Mark is opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. Servants of God, with their face lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the gospel from heaven. By thousands of voices, all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, and the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers, friends. We haven't seen nothing yet. So what are we to be doing right now? Having known all these things, friends, there's one single thing I want to place much emphasis on today as we bring this to a close. Zechariah 10 verse 1 says, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, and the Lord shall make bright cloud and give them showers of rain to everyone grassed in the field. 
In Luke 11, 13, we are told, if you then, being evil, know how to give gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? The appeal is very simple. Lord, I need your Holy Spirit. Is this your desire today? Put your hands up, please. Raise your hands and say, Lord, I want your Holy Spirit. Bow your head with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so very, very much. We have much more to experience by the power of the Holy Spirit. As a church, as individuals, Lord, we approach your throne and we say, Lord, fill our cups, Lord. We raise it up. And we pray that the Spirit of the living God will fall afresh on us today. That the latter rain will visit our homes today. That you will use us to make an impact in this world. You will use us to be a blessing to the church. You will use us, Father, as you did, or even more of that of the early church. We thank you because we know that your promises are sure. You will do exactly as you already promised. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Shall we all stand together as we sing our benediction, hymn number 262, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. Dismiss us, Lord, with your blessing, that we may each invite your Holy Spirit into our hearts, into our lives, that we will be used by your Holy Spirit to be a blessing to those around us, to this community, to the whole world, that we will cooperate with heaven in the work that is to go forth to bring a harvest in that great day when Jesus comes again, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.